So I guess we can we can start. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, I'm going to start by introducing myself and then the the three guest critics joining us today. Uh, I'm Nacho Marti. I'm a, a environmental and technical studies coordinator at the AA, and also a studio master in first year. And we are joined uh, today uh, by three critics. Uh, the first critic is Madeline Kessler, who is trained both as an architect and engineer and is experienced in working with complex urban sites, placing community, craft and making at the heart of design. As co-curator of the British Pavilion at the Venice Biennale uh, in uh, Architecture Biennale 2021 and co-founder of Unseen Architecture, she's currently exploring how we can better open up privatized public space, making it accessible to all. Madeline has nearly a decade of practice experience, having previously worked at Hayworth Tompkins Architects, Haptic Architects, HHF Architects, and, and Studio Weave. Passionate about promoting our creative understanding of the city, Madeline sits on the National Infrastructure Commission's Design Group, teaches at the London School of Architecture, and regularly runs workshops, including for the National Saturday Club Trust. She was awarded the 2019 RBA Rising Star Award and named as one of the Architects Journals 40 Under 40. So thank you very much, Mari. Very good to see you. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. And next critic is Arthur Mamoumani, who is a French architect and director of Mamoumani Architects, who specializes in a new kind of digitally designed and fabricated architecture. He's a lecturer at the University of Westminster and owns a digital fabrication laboratory called the FabPub. Arthur was selected as one of the Arab Year Journal's 2017 cohort of rising stars. He has won the gold prize at the American Architecture Prize for the Wooden Wave project installed at Bureau Hubble Engineering. And since 2016, he's a fellow of the Royal Society of Encouragement of Arts, Manufactures and Commerce. Prior to founding Mamoumani in 2011, he worked with Atelier Jean Nouvel, Saharid Architects, and Proctor and Matthews Architects. Thank you very much, Arthur. Very good to see you again. Hey, great to see you, Nacho. Thank you very much for that. My pleasure. And finally, we have Pablo Zamorano, who is a Chilean architect and head of geometry and computational design at Heather Week Studio where he works across all studio projects, providing expertise and guidance on new technologies, techniques, and the execution of challenging geometries. He graduated from Universidad Central in Chile in 2004, and he holds an MSc from the Emerging Technologies and Design Program at the AA, and he has practiced in Santiago de Chile, New York, and London, and is currently teaching a lecture course at the AA in fourth year. So thank you, Pablo, for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Matt. Thank you so much. Okay, if our students are ready, we have first uh, four students from Experimental Unit 10. Uh, uh, they are second year students. Uh, so, Monzi, Juliet, Lee, Celine, are you ready? Yeah. Good How are you there. guys? Thanks, Nacho. We're really fine. How are you? Good. Good to see you. Very good to see you. Are you presenting or who's presenting? Yeah, I'll share the document and we are presenting together. Perfect. Okay, so the floor is yours. Cool. Hi, uh, I am Juliette and we are second year students from uh, Experimental 10, teach by Valentin and Winston. This year our unit is called Cost and we would love to share with you a part of our term one projects. We introduced ourselves to the subject cost by questioning what a cost is and then making one ourselves. Each of us having different lockdown conditions, we decided to make a cost of something close to us. Replicating an object or maybe the opposite of costing an empty space and in between. In my case, I had a walk through my room. I had a look at what objects were, pre at what objects were present that I could use to cast with. I gathered nine different objects and grouped them together on the floor. Instead of casting a replica of an object found in my room, I decided to compose these gathered objects so that they create a mold for a new object to become. The objects are wrapped together with a tape and a mixture of water and cement was then poured inside to harden. Once dry, the mold could easily be disassembled in order for all the sides of the cast to be readable. Each side has traces from the objects it took its shape and texture from. And interesting is how 
he can read the history of objects through its surface. An experimental way of observing and analyzing the traces on the surface of the mold is by placing it on a scanner. The scanner is only capable of capturing what is very close to the scanning device, which gives the result a nice feeling of depth and form. Now, Lee, on the other hand, has his objects literally in the hand and really has another an interesting take on uh, the brief. I'll let him have a look at it now. I am Lee, and my car is a replica of an umbrella handle. My car was inspired by the painting, This is not a pipe. The umbrella handle is not only related to our hands, but also is originated from the walking stick, appear in the paintings that were associated with the idea of flaneur. The first attempt was to create a two-part mold with plaster. However, the second part of the mold cannot be released. They have to break the mold in order to retrieve the handle. This is the first mold. In my second attempt, the mold was made. However, uh, when I cast that with resin and that combined with the porous uh, plaster, luckily, I. I'm able to make the prints out of the mold that I used the, uh, the print in order to examine the mold. And the third mold was integrated with uh, silicon. Eventually, I was able to cast the handle with resin and wax. The process of casting is the process of retranslation and the replica has transformed. An interface was designed to transform the replica even further. Through the using of a hot steam to heat up the copper plate, the wax will melt slowly and try to break down the recognizable symbol of the umbrella handle. Now I will pass it to Monsi, and she cast an object that she found on the street of London. Hi, I'm Monsi, and today I'll be presenting um, my process of casting a London plane leaf. I chose it because I thought that the leaf was quite unique to London and yet quite banal. But more importantly, I could get them for free from a London plane tree outside my flat. Um, the intention behind the process of making the cast for me was to generate a precise copy of it. And so I started first by photographing the leaf, scanning it, drawing it, photogrammetrying it, and finally 3D scanning it at the DPL. And so now having an understanding of the London plane leaf structure, I had to select an appropriate leaf. And for this, I considered the withering of the leaf. Um, I observed the withering through repeatedly making reliefs of the leaf. And I stopped when I thought that the leaf was far too um, damaged or unrecognizable. And so this informed my decision to select a fresh looking leaf. Now moving on to the mold making, similar to leaf, I attempted to create a two-part plaster mold for slip casting, but failed. And as a result, I tried to 3D print um, a mold, but I could not resolve it to um, the thinness of the leaf. So I finally attempted with a silicon mold that I made with silicon caulk and corn flour. And this is the result that I got. However, um, as it was able to achieve the thinness that I wanted, I tried a few more times and I managed to arrive at this final cast. And to wrap up, the last image that I'll be showing um, um, depicts the processes that I worked with. And now I will pass the time to Selin, who had a dog find the objects for her. I am Selin. So last time I was staying by the beach in Çeşme in Izmir, and as we would walk my friend's uh, dog, she would end up digging objects that were drift to the shore. So my process of selecting objects to cast got reversed and they ended up choosing me instead. And I wanted to find a way to adapt an Anatolian tradition of lead casting, which is originally made to predict the future and to protect one from the curse of the evil eye. So I started to investigate both techniques of melting lead and casting it by dropping it in the water. So a traditional Turkish coffee pot, which is called the Jezve, melts the lead pellets and the process is rather fast. But then I wanted to restructure this method so that it would possibly be uh, able to carry it out in the nature. So to make it more mobile and the wind slowed down the process, but it was still manageable. And the casts of the imprints, uh, these objects leave on sand, they had a potential to tell stories. So for me, the interesting part was how nature eliminated these objects. And so I made a collage of the shore 
and acknowledged that these items were totally stripped off of their conventional uses and in a functional sense, they were at the end of their lives. So the solidifying process of the cast is approximately 10 seconds and it needs 20 more seconds to call off, but the surface of the casts becomes this fusion of lead and sand texture. And even after a thorough cleaning process, these elements of nature, they were inseparable to the cast. And because they had merged during the solidifying process, the interface is not solely a connector, but it's also what precisely determines the physical characteristic of the cast object. So I distinguished the two types of sand, coarse and very fine sand, and got the imprint of their te surface textures. And as the interface became more homogeneous, the lead became more susceptible um, to the grain particles and the sand pieces and rocks would be also visible in the cast. Then lastly, going back to these scenes, I was concerned with the journey that led them there. So in an attempt to cast a light on these journeys, I constructed a line language and made an uh, alternative proposals for the object's histories and taking into account the wind rolls, the tidal waves and the built environment. I made uh, several scenarios and placed them in these diagrams. So the photographs captured their death, the imprint casts immortalized their last marks on earth and the diagrams in a way commemorated their journeys. Um, in the end, we noticed that each of us had another take on observing our, our surrounding space differently and really relied on different techniques and materials to cast with. And these then became a starting point to develop our yearly projects. And as we build up a vocabulary and a position uh, guided by the notion and action of a cast and process of casting. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, everyone. There's a uh, lovely positive energy coming from you all. Great, uh, yeah, great energy coming from you. And I think it's so good to see um, a lot of making when, when some units or some, some uh, students at the school retreat safely into digital realms. I think it's great to actually see so much making, no? Uh, um, before we open up uh, uh, to the to the rest of the critics, I would like to ask you, um, what what did you get, uh, or how do you compare the real object that you cast from the different uh, from the different casts, and what kind of things are you learning from from this difference from the real object to the to the different casts you produce? What what is these cast objects uh, giving you? Um, for me, I can say that they really open up uh, me for, I mean, they allow me to see the areas that would not be seen otherwise, because when you cast a negative of something, then it allows you to very much read the surface. And since I'm very concerned with the surface, for me, it was quite crucial to really have the lead poured in every bit and see the shape, compare the shape. Yeah, I would agree with Celine, especially in my case, um, the, the cast was all about the surface. So combining nine different objects um, with some experimental changes in it, like I got some nice surfaces to, to look at. And yeah, that was quite interesting. For me, the umbrella handle is already very symbolic in a way. And by reproducing the object, that I try to reflect on the role. Um, what is the cast? What what does the cast mean to the original object? Um, and I'll just finally answer. Uh, I think for me the cast was some sort of translation, some sort of, of edit of the original object, which is why I strived really hard to to understand the original um object initially, um, knowing that I'll lose part of it. So. Um, one thing that I kind of preserved from the original object to my cast was the thinness. Uh, I think that was very important for me. Yeah. Thank you. So Pablo, Madi, Arthur, do you have any questions or comments? I don't know if I have a specific question, but I'm uh, definitely fascinated by, by all the exercises. Um, um, I love to see things, uh, you know, physical objects come in uh, as, as kind of outcomes of explorations of ideas, you know. Um, in a way, I value them even more than the ideas itself uh, because they are real, you know, they, they truly, I think, converge uh, intention, I think. 
Um, I maybe I'm 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 interesting to understand how uh, how all these explorations in a way can come together because uh, I see a lot of things that so because you're casting uh, you're registering the space in between something you know um, and uh, you have literally the space in between objects you have the space that is left by uh, by by one object or by a multiple of them. Uh, and then you have uh, kind of a new type of object that emerge out of this. And um, uh, there is where I, I see kind of the, this, this multiplicity of, of, of opportunities and objects. You know? So for instance, the umbrella, which is argu arguably the, the most simple one in terms of uh, what you can cast, um, one may say maybe even the most boring one, is able to communicate so much and I think um, it becomes something completely new, right? You are casting something that even has uh, life. It, it will. It is it, not. It's not frozen in time, but actually becomes alive and die, in a way. Uh, when I was looking at it, I, I thought, well, you know, maybe it would be good to cast in ice, you know, because uh, it's an umbrella. So imagine you use rainwater just to capture the rainwater that was coming from that that umbrella, and then and then it becomes just it becomes just water after all. Um, but truly fascinated about about all of them, you know. Um, I'm I'm just curious about how how you guys kind of take this farther or want to take this farther as as a line of, of thought. Um, so after this brief, we had an additional follow up brief called the interface, and that's when we most of us kind of really explored the connection between our casts and the surrounding space. So that was a bit more focused on that, and some of us I think touched upon the introduction to that place but um yeah so does anyone want to jump in and talk about their interfaces or should i i mean i'll give a quick example of what i did because in my picture is going to be like a rope i mean what i basically did is a very, something very simple but to be able to observe all the interfaces from all the size sides because that was kind of the, the main thing that i wanted to look at in my result i hanged it on my ceiling and uh, put a counterweight on the other side that like uh, how do you say it? that was exactly the same weight as my um, cast so i could look on it on all sides so that was like a simple but nice example of a interface to observe it yeah uh, maddie arthur do you have any comments or questions yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. I really appreciated how it was so collaborative as well. Um, and I really commend you all for, in you know, amongst everything that's going on to still go out and make things because I agree it's so important to make things and test things with your hands. And I think it's a really fantastic way to learn. Um, so really well done and that they're all really interesting and beautiful pieces. Um, I suppose what really struck me was whether there's a way to... Um, I don't know, almost sort of collage your findings together or um, sort of how you would learn from one another's uh, pieces of casting and objects and perhaps help that to inform your work going forward. Um, like what was the main, what do you think were the main things you've learned um, from watching each other go through this process? Because I think you're all very eloquent at speaking about what you personally had learned from, from the making process. Um, but I'd be really interested to know uh, what sort of intrigued you about each other's projects? Um, go ahead. <laughs> should I? Yeah, I think before each of us kind of coming down to a decision on what we actually wanted to cast and which materials we wanted to use to cast, we all went through a quite an experimental process where we, I attempted to do something with chocolate and Juliet attempted to do something with another thing and everyone kind of saw that process. So we each kind of, in a way, during the tutorials, exposed us to a lot of cast making procedures. And it's not the same as looking up yourself than talking to someone who actually tried and did do those things. So it's, uh, it's a very good vocabulary to really, it was a very good um, archive that I, I think every, all of us kind of have in the back of our minds for future projects and for future materials. When someone talks about wax molding, I immediately will go back and think about a friend's project and see 
say like it's as if I made it because I know it so dearly yeah so that's that was a very nice thing yeah exactly I was going to say the same seeing like people use different materials and in different cases like um, Manzi needed to make something very thin so now I kind of remember like ah, if I need to make something fragile that can not break too much maybe I can like go to her because I remember she used wax and all that stuff so yeah seeing other people's their experiences yeah and I think like through the tutorial process you know um, we we got to see Selin's lead casting in the sand in 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 pretty good um like detail throughout the entire process and I think this was one of the very practical aspects of, of learning or knowing at least the possibilities tried out by, by other people um but yeah um I think it was it was amazing um the plurality of the materials that was used in the unit itself was very wide so yeah it adds more to this whole learning process yeah and that's also I think something that we all very miss so much in this remote learning process so once we had the opportunity to really kind of have that studio environment when we see a lot of people produce a lot of things in their thought process and their exploration process it was it was a big change to that online remote learning thing that was a bit more real life like mm -hmm. Arthur would you like to yeah add, comment happy to jump in <clears throat> it feels quite special for me because i remember about 15 years ago i was presenting for the open jury and i was arguing with uh, adam Furman at the time we were third year about what's parametric and what's real science what's not and that's how it feels quite special because we're still having these debates so what you guys are doing now is really part of your personality and how you're going to develop yourself as a as an architect and and your chance to present it to everyone is is a very special moment um, I, there's a few things. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm so impressed that you've managed to make things because especially as you're stuck at home. And also, uh, casting is a method that we use, for example, in our studio, uh, lost wax, stuff like that. So it's a very real way of manufacturing. It's something that you can do yourself. So it's very important. I really love how some of you said you love the real thing, the precise copy, I think, Monzi, you said. And then one of you said, uh, uh, you know, you use Margaret saying this is not a pipe and then it's not quite an exact copy, is it? So even within your group, you have interesting contradictions. Um, I think one thing that I was missing a little bit is maybe what happens to these copies that are not really copies, because at the end of the day, it will never be a true copy, right? And so it would have been nice to see as you serialize it, as you make many of them, what do you lose? What does it become? You know, it becomes a thing of its own. So, and I, I think seeing that, that series together as opposed to just one, you know, would bring us more in the field of, um, less in the field of the object and the thing, but more in the field of what it becomes as it's being multiplied and lost and failed. And, you know, so something very wabi-zabi about it. Like, <laughs> and then the other thing is context. Uh, I think uh, uh, Pablo mentioned to do an umbrella with water or ice. Um, and similarly, I think the leaf, you could bring it back to the tree um, and you could actually show how uncanny it becomes when the leaf goes back to its original setting. And that will emphasize what you said about it not being a pipe, for example. So I just had two, uh, my two cents on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think the word process has been mentioned a number of times. and. In, 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 four, uh, in four presentations, we've seen many different processes. And there was only one uh, engaging with, with digital fabrication techniques, no? and you touched upon this now, Arthur. Do you guys think that uh, in the context of lockdown, uh, kind of the lack of resources is actually sharpening with, or how do you see uh, limitations uh, in, in what can be done as, as, as a way to actually become more inventive? Uh, did you did you find restrictions or did you feel it was an opportunity to do things in a low tech, very domestic uh, way? I mean, I guess there's always an object that you can make a model with, uh, even though even if it's just a piece of paper. So being in lockdown maybe was maybe making it easier for ourselves, having less possibilities around us. Uh, instead of being in school, even though it's very nice to be in school and that stuff and having the wor workshop. But just being limited to a pair of scissors, tape, and paper, for example, already puts that down and maybe allows you to experiment more in, like, on another um, 
another part of the exercise instead of like trying to find the yeah the right material something like that yeah yeah I think opportunity and restriction goes hand in hand so when when you're restricted from one end which in this case in lockdown cases is let's say the physical aspect of things like the wood workshops and the DPL and uh, then you get a bit more of an opportunity and you, you, you kind of become more perceptive as a result of that restriction to other techniques. So I think it's always at the end an opportunity. And that's what we kind of felt as I think as a group, because we were constantly producing and constantly finding for ways. And yes, also this is not the end. So maybe next year as well, once we have access to digital fabrication methods and other uh, labs in a fair old back in London, hopefully, then maybe these things can go back and up. Then it will be very interesting to see how digital fabrication methods can even further enhance the projects that we started. Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll answer it as well. Um, in the context of lockdown, the limitations are real in London. And um, I feel like what happened to me in, in this whole uh, journey was that I I realized like I've been taking all these workshops and, and uh, DPL for granted and um, I did my class initially in the toilet which moved to the kitchen which moved to the living room and I mean it, it, it just become it, it just um, worked in you I guess to like improvise and to adapt and to overcome so I, I guess it makes you think on your feet a, a bit more in the end you know you still have to pr produce a class Cost and we just find more ways to do it, I guess. Yeah, I think in the making it in the moment, so you're, you're like not really that happy having to like trying not to step on your models all around on the floor in your room. But looking back at it, yeah, I mean, there are some nice and fun results. Yeah. I agree, but at the same time, we are also able to look more, even more closely to our object and even more have more control about our object in the same time. Do you think now sort of going forward, you might be less precious about uh, making with your own hands? Um, I just think when I, when I was studying my part one, um, the, the school I was at didn't have any like laser cutters or anything. So we used to all just make models out of like cereal boxes. Um, and then the year I left, they invested in a laser cutter and all the models started to look the same. And everyone was quite limited by what they could actually do with that piece of technology, rather than when you're just making stuff with your hands and you're sort of, as you're going along, learning from your mistakes. Um, and I wonder if, do you, do you feel that's something you might now take forward in your work, kind of being, being less precious and just use like you know utilizing whatever objects are around you yeah definitely I, I i think definitely because now we were all kind of forced to see what in what areas that we were kind of more strong when we have to like deal with things firsthand and i think um yes definitely like doing something very accurate with the laser cutter is cool but doing something from your hand like it's like your child, you sleep with it, you kind of go through the entire process yourself. So then it's completely something very much unique and maybe a combination of those two, the accuracy that comes from the fabrication techniques and the individuality that hand, hand making and model making with your hands kind of brings. If one could really kind of combine them and make them work together very nicely, then it would be for me an ideal combination. <laughs> I don't know what others think. Yeah, no, exactly. Same for me. Only, uh, like you said, like using the laser cutter is still an easy op an easy option in a way that it's strong and like you put things together if it has to go quick, but it's not the same for sure. Yeah. You should, I think you should show your struggle. I, I, you know, I, I think there's something like, uh, it's obvious, right? That it's challenging at the moment. And it's obvious that you, and what, when you said, uh, it's in my bathroom, I started to do it on top of the toilets and stuff. Like there is a certain creativity to that, that anyone can appreciate. And, and this wit and creativity is really what makes at the end an architect, I think. And so to show this and to, to turn it into something as part of your project, I think would be nice.
Yeah, I also think as you were, were presenting, the most interesting parts were when something hadn't quite worked and there was sort of, then it, there begins to be like a certain level of abstraction and reinterpreting what you're doing. Um, and see, so, yeah, I think just like Arthur's saying to like really celebrate those moments. Yeah, I think, I think it's also quite interesting to see how you guys engage with the materials because um, what often happened when you, when you go onto kind of the laser cutter route or, you know, you go, you kind of, you, you go running straight to the to digital fabrication, sometimes you kind of forget about the qualities that different materials can give you. And I think the process of casting actually um, really, really puts kind of emphasis on these different properties that different surfaces have, right? So even though you're not necessarily casting, uh, casting wood with wood, uh, you are in a way capturing uh, some really interesting uh, properties about you know whatever object or material you're casting um, on. So so I think that's something that through this or maybe after this exercise is just gonna stay with you. And I think you whatever you do from now on. I'm pretty sure you some somewhere you know in the back of your mind is going to be asking you, hey, where is this richness? You know, where is this texture? You know, what are all these things that vary from one object to another? And you're going to in a way push it, you know, regardless of the medium you you, you keep working with. So I think that's a huge value um, of wor working directly, basically with with your hands, you know. I'm conscious of the time. Uh, if there are no uh, further questions or comments, perhaps we can move to uh, the next uh, student, uh, who is uh, Jun Tao from first year. Jun Tao, are you with us? Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Bye -bye. Great work. Hello, Jun Tao. Uh, hi, Nature. I'm here. How are you? I'm um, fine, thank you. And how are you? Good. Happy new Chinese year. <laughs> ah, thank you. Okay, when you're ready, Jun Tao, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, I'm Jun Tao, and I'm a first year student in AA. Uh, and currently, I'm located in China, Beijing. So uh, in this time, we have focused on the modes of life and how we inhabit the space. And this brief home learning is an investigation of the space that we used for home working, and like it's really a direct response to our current situation. And basically, we have took our own working environment as our case studies, and to investigate that space as well as the uh, inhabitation patterns through physical model making. And in my case, it would be my bedroom. So uh, the project starts with a measured survey of the space and an inventory was created for all the architectural elements and the essential furniture. Uh, a band of 10 scale physical model was simply created as an uh, expression of that space. Uh, so in parallel, we have also researched about the German artist Thomas Demand and used his work as a, a visual and a conceptual reference during the model making process. So like after that, it comes to the actual model making process and due to the pandemic, the options of material and equipment are quite limited. And basically the only things that I have are some form boards, A4 printing paper and white card paper. But like, just like when I natural said, I think it's really an opportunity for me. Like it pushes me to think about like, uh, how could I use those materials to achieve different desired effects? So this is me investigating different types of lining paper finish and possible covering method of the foam board. And like making handles of furniture uh, using bending like paper, paper clips and uh, some finished furniture. And this is me trying to Sorry, like simulate some- so Sorry, yeah. the, the slides are not, are not uh, moving. We are still in, in the uh, slide where you show the blue colors. Now, yeah, but we miss one. If you can go uh, the page number nine, we miss that one. Sorry to interrupt. That one? Yeah, the one where you were talking about the door handles, we missed that one. 
So can you see the screen right now? Yeah, now it's moving. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so like this is me trying to simulate some soft objects such as a uh, bed sheet and pillow using uh, like A4, A4 paper as well. Because if you use the actual fabric, there will be a wrong scale uh, in its pattern. So by wetting the paper and its material, like the characteristic is actually changed. It becomes relatively soft and a little bit transparent, which can then be shaped into desirable forms. And it also like visually unified with other rest components. And this is my bed. And after that, there is uh, an experiment about the texture of the floor. So I have tried from very realistic wood strips texture to abstracted version and then to single solid color. And I think like one of the most important thing in making those like physical scale model is to determine the level of abstraction that you want to have in the model. So like in the other word is like, I think it's important to decide what information and feature is essential to this space and what is less important and can be abstracted. So for example, there is a comparison between the, the actual space and the model that I made. So as you can see that I'm like, I'm not making every single object in detail. Like some things like the laptop, I think they're important for this kind of life. So I have like put more effort on it. There are others, for example, the storage box and the books, like the, for me, I think it's not that special. So I just made using, using white paper to make the messing of those objects. And I think this kind of judgment happens throughout the model making process. And like it actually enables me to have a deeper understanding of the nature of that space and to say like what really matters. And finally, at the last stage of this project, uh, a, series, a series of photographs was taken uh, to, ref to reflect that space in which we are currently working. And I have tested different lighting conditions because I think for me, the natural light is also a key element in that space. Uh, so this is like different uh, testing results. And those are my five final photos. Yeah, and I think that's pretty much my presentation. Thank you for your listening. Thank you very much, Jun Tao. Um, Arthur, Madi, Pablo, do you have any questions? or comments for you in town? Uh, I, <clears throat> sorry, I can jump in. Um, I, I really enjoyed this project, uh, Juntao. I, I think you're, the fact that you're using your room as a project is perfect for the situation that's happening now. I, it gets really uncanny. It took me a while to realize it's actually a physical thing, not a render. So that's like adding even more beauty to it. But I, it, there is an uncanny nat nature to it. Like, it, it, I wonder if you could then start bringing a bit more surrealism. Like, I wonder if suddenly a sort of uh, new imaginary thing gets in the room that are beyond the uh, the uncanniness and more in the surreal level. I mean, after that, I don't know the brief of your pro of your. But I, I just I was kind of excited to suddenly see an image, an imaginary creature, or some kind of uh, a flower that emerged from nowhere. And and because you have that freedom, you. It's like you've, um, you're now owning your room and it became your project. And it's like, where is that narrative going? Like, where do you take us from there? I'm kind of excited to see that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's such a beautiful uh, model. Like, well done. Re it's, it was really enjoyable presentation and it's a really beautiful uh, photography and model that you've made. Um, I suppose two things, firstly, I wondered why you didn't actually insert yourself into the model um, or whether you'd thought about sort of putting yourself in there and starting to also then perhaps think about, I don't know what, you, what you're sort of developing as an architect as well through this model making experience. Um, and um, also whether you felt that you could also push the paper as a material further in other ways. I think it's really interesting when you showed the water experiment and it, it comes across so well as your duvet cover. And I wonder if there are other ways to uh, push paper as a material. Um, and then I, I think finally, I just, I thought it would like lend itself to as like a sort of stage set for an animation or something really well. I don't know if that's something you're considering doing next, um, but yeah, I'd love to hear where you think you're gonna take this model next. Uh, thank you. 
And yeah, like I'm not pay, uh, placing an actual human figure in that space, like because I want to make it like have a consistent uh, like any atmosphere of that space. And like I can obviously not make a human like as realistic as as other furniture. That's one point. But also at the same time, like I'm trying to make the the choices of like human beings. For example, like the laptop is open, and you can see this is a panel of Reno. And like the paper strips and the books, they're also like, they're not placed very uh, evenly, like they are like just randomly placed on the, uh, on, on the desk and also some paper on the floor. So I think I want to use those details to show that like this is a very dynamic space used by, uh, used by myself. And in order to like to take the project moving forward, I think, yeah, I think it's really important. Uh, I think it's very interesting if I can like, Add some surrealist, uh, like uh, elements within that space. I think, like, and I got like I, I can do it quite easily. I mean, just use some maybe collage or uh, putting some paper strips with different figures inside, and to see like what effect is this going to be create. Yeah, I I, I think it's really kind of um, almost ghostly how how you haven't inserted yourself and um yeah I, I mean when you speak about it it definitely makes sense so yeah there's a comment in the chat uh, about Thomas Demand uh, just to clarify that we did look in detail at the work of Thomas Demand and we used him as a as a main reference so we we learned a lot from Thomas Demand um and this uncanniness that, that uh, Arthur was talking about is always present in Thomas work uh, how to convey human presence without having the the the, the figure there, and you you replied very well, uh, Juntao. No, the, you just left the room. You were there, but you just left. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe maybe I can jump in. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, first, uh, yeah, uh, um, I want to congratulate you on the work. I think it's it's uh, incredible to see you know this this level of detail. Um, definitely got my mind kind of twisted you know several times i think um i think i think madeline touched on something quite interesting here when when she when she asked about uh where your body was in there or where yourself you know was 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 in this process and i think it's from from where i see it is it's partly related to the question of scale um when we work in models um usually we work at a scale we work at something that uh will be in a way smaller that will uh, enable you to kind of represent some some important factors of a different reality that you are trying to project onto in this case your room and um that plays uh, very well for some things and not so well for other things right so when we want to um let's say plan very quickly about something it works fairly well when we want to uh, kind of test the performance of something or whether something um, works or not, uh, maybe not so well. And we try to always to scale up, you know, and, and try to kind of jump into a prototype or a mock-up at one-to-one. -one. So I wonder uh, in, in between these two realities that you built, because they both are now fairly real, you know, where do you see kind of the value for connecting both of them back together. You know, um, think, think about this from, from, from the, the point of the scale. You know, uh, one, one way of, of thinking about this may be, for instance, you know, so you said, I put a lot of effort on some things, some things I didn't. You know, so you were making observations through the modeling process. You know, those things that, you, that really caught your atten attention may be some areas that now you, you may reflect back onto, onto the one-to-one -one scale and you may start, let's say, making some interventions in your room at a real scale. I don't know, for instance, you know, I, I just want to pick your brain about, about the, the, the sense of a scale and how these two little worlds that you put together can start uh, communicating. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And um, I think, yeah, it's really interesting because by taking this pictures and actually placing that scale model in the actual space. So like they're both existing in the same physical space and like I can observe them like at the same time. 
So like I'm inside the real physical room looking inward to that scaled model. And I think it's a quite like interesting experience to uh, like make a really make a comparison. And I think like it's also about the, the hierarchy of information. Uh, like because uh, for this brief, we are studying about the, uh, the, the modes of life, the home learning. So like, I, th I mean, like for those kind of things that are important to home learning, uh, like I obviously put more efforts and want to highlight them in, in my model. But for the others, like uh, it's more like random. But for the actual space, I like everything I think uh, they got a, a equal value, like uh, at least from my perspective. So like they're all in the same level of detail and they're also like uh, with different textures and uh, steps. So, I mean, I mean, like, I think it's really to look at it from a different reality, like uh, the, the, the models that I made using, only using paper and from board. Also, if I can elaborate on, on uh, Madi's and, and Arthur's comments on uh, what's next. So this is the first part of a brief that it's mainly analysis for surveying, analysis and synthesis through model making. So they made, the students made a lot of decisions sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. And now the second stage is actually uh, engaged with an iterative design process, Mo modify this space based on what's important for them. And, and also it, with regards to these two scales, no, the one-to-one the, the, the -one scale, the room with the model inside, they had to modify the space actually to reflect light, to block light, to raise the, the model. So this actually, the placement of the model into the space was very important. In this case, Junta was, was bringing the, the model very close to the window, which is what we would normally do, no? Uh, design a building that has nice uh, sun, sunlight. So I think there were very architectural operations in the, in, in, the, in the movement of the model around the space, how to block, how to allow light, and uh, how to avoid refl un unnecessary reflections or even backgrounds, no? Uh, so I think that the next step will be about uh, modifying this space based on what, what's important for Junta or for the students. I think the one, one thing that's missing is you should have a little model of your model in the model. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I was going to say the same. I love to see the model place where you actually placed it, you know. That also rem uh, you know, refers about uh, to, to how you control things, you know, so now you, you master the control, for instance, not only about the, the, the modeling techniques, you know, and the, and the re realism of this, but you also master the control of the light. You know, you master the control of many other things that are now part of the context environment, you know, of, of where you're placing your mold. So that is something really, really interesting to, to keep developing now. Yeah, I also think it's really interesting what you decided not to include. So yourself being one of them, but also you know, all the other stuff that was on your desk when you showed the photo and, you know, actually like, um, I think thinking about what hasn't been included and uh, why not is is super interesting as well. Yeah, exactly. There's all these other bits and bobs. Whether that also changes your kind of relationship with them in real life, because maybe you realize something's not quite as necessary as you thought it was, or I don't know. Any concluding uh, comments or questions? I, I, I didn't want to bother you, so I, I wrote it down, but um, I don't know if you know Michel Gondry, the French uh, uh, director. He makes little models that look, almost look real and then starts animating them. And I, I just wonder if also, now that you've mastered your room and you've mastered the pictures, if you start slowly into moving <laughs> things around, but maybe in the same uncanny fashion. I like how you, you said that, Basically, the question we ask, it seems like you've considered them and it, that makes it even better, your project. But in that spirit of uncanny, maybe something can slowly move. And like, you're like, what the hell's going on there? And, uh, and that will also be quite uncanny. Or maybe there the, so there is this ghostly present that continues even more. Uh, and then, yeah, in the, in the spirit of what Madeline said, like how you would see a little model in the model. Like, I wonder if suddenly you watch at the window and you realize, you know, slowly by focus, playing with the focus that it's the actual room behind the window. And, and you're like kind of stuck in a, <laughs> in a smaller version of it. There's a fractal thing that could be really interesting. So there's a lot of potential, yeah. 
Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Spider, oh, sorry. Go for it. I was going to say, or like a spider crawls across or something. And then <laughs> that would be really Very good. Thank you very much, Jun Tao. Terrific work. Thank you. Uh, thanks for presenting thank today. You. Great work. And thank you, Arthur, Maddie, and Pablo, for your comments. Uh, we have next another first year student. Uh, it's Lo, uh, talking about uh, Perreo texture. Uh, Laura, are you with us? Yes. How are you? Good, thank you. Very good. Thanks for presenting today. So the floor is all yours when you're ready. Yes, I will share my screen. Great. Okay, can you see the presentation? Yes, very clearly. So Okay, so uh, I studied the pereo, which is a form of Latin dance or relaxed attitude or being lazy combined with architecture and studying um, all of the Latin culture through the, its urban uh, elements, fashion and movement. So we did that through two video clips. The first one is Malamente by Rosalia. So here are some stills to give you an idea of what I'm going to be talking about. And Caramelo by Ozuna, Carol G and Mike Towers. Again, some styles to give you an idea. So the first part of the project was a, a group research um, that I did with um, three other students. Uh, the first part was uh, analyzing the urban elements, um, drawing them in very different perspective and understanding how they appear and what they represent. So this is in Malamente, uh, how lines are combined and uh, how they can be transgressed and how space is used. Also in Caramelo, um, which is a very different landscape, very pink and where objects change, of fun uh, change functions, where ice cream becomes hot air balloon and donuts are in rivers, a cake becomes a throne. So a very, very, two very diff different worlds. And what we did was analyzing the fashion first with Rosalia, who has a lot of cultural references to um, the Spanish culture. She wears a lot of polka dots, which are actually a reference to flamenco, a lot of red, also uh, very prominent in Spanish culture and even an outfit that was inspired by the Torero in the Corrida, which also appears in her clip. And we've made some taxonomies to really classify each element and to see when they appear. Um, and it's a bit like an architecture retracing where the materials come from and what they represent and how they're used. Same thing with Ozuna, who wears very bright clothes and very sweet streetwear and he takes this idea of the 90s um, streetwear style in the United States, but revisiting it with uh, a Latin perspective. He also plays a lot with scale um, because he wears vests and under that a sweatshirt to appear bigger. So again, he dresses also in a very architectural manner. Um, and Carol G, the same, she is very seductive. She wants to attract a lot of attention with her bright and revealing clothes, which is also what a building would do to us ideally or not. But um, yeah, having these different perspectives. Um, yeah, the hair also is a very prominent feature. She plays a lot around with um, sort of a cherry on top of the cake. That's what it makes me think about. And then we analyze the movement uh, of all the artists and their clips. Uh, for Rosalia, it's very manly. Her behavior is very feminist. She asserts her power a lot. And what I thought was interesting was how she transgresses a lot of limits, limits in behavior, limits in space. She dances on a parking lot where she's not really supposed to go to. And she dances in the middle of the street. So yeah, that I thought was interesting. And Uzuna, him on the other side, doesn't move a lot. We just um, look at him having a lot of hand gestures and different facial expressions but it's quite of the opposite as Rosalia. He interacts a lot with the camera and really wants to grasp the attention of the viewer. And finally, Carol G. So again, really this seductive idea that really comes back even when she moves. There are a lot of close-ups. So she um, uses space in a very different manner because she doesn't move a lot like Azuna and Rosalia her really interacts with it. And finally, um, we split up then to do some individual designs that are based on Pereo. Um, for that, we had some design precepts and I was looking at the regulation of space. So how is space um, limited or not? And who to whom do limits apply, what and when? Um, especially when Rosalia is on a crossroad but doesn't respect it and gets hit by a car. So I was also interested in the consequences of that. Of scale, as I mentioned with Ozuna and um, in the video of Caramelo. As I thought it was interesting because scale, you can 
view it in two different ways. When the objects are out of scale, it's either the cake is at normal scale and everyone is very small, or it's everyone is at no, like the humans are at normal size, but the cake is huge. So I think there's an interesting ambivalence in that. Um, and finally, the universal slash the generic versus the specific. So with Rosalia's very specific cultural references or a stop sign, you have the complete opposite that are combined in one video clip, yet we understand everything, but to what extent? Um, so this is my design process. I was interested at first in how I could regulate a tennis court because we see a lot of sports uh, elements appearing in Rosalia's clip and also how light can regulate space. These are the first um, ideas and just creating a sort of um, ambivalent space and multifunctional. And this ended up in creating um, a, a space where cars and humans could cohabit at different times of the day. So from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m., you would do some basketball and some running. Um, you could have uh, from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., you can do some tennis and some running. And uh, from 6 p.m. to 8 a.m., there's the parking lot that comes in and humans are not allowed in the space, but it's only for cars now. And at night, uh, it changes completely. So again, it's still a parking lot, but there is a specific day in, on the weekends where uh, cars and humans can cohabit as it is a drive-in cinema. So just having this uh, really multifunctional space that combines both worlds that appear in both of the clips. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Great work. Um, can I start perhaps, uh, where do you see this going? I know you don't know the, the kind of the second part of the brief, but uh, what, would, how, what would you like to explore further? Or how do you would continue to, to explore the issue, well, the issues that we, you've been uh, analyzing and working with? Um, well, um, there are very different things that interest and are found interesting is, um, first of all, the idea of context, maybe because my, um, my project is not contextualized at all. I mean, it was the aim not to contextualize it, but maybe to push it further and actually seeing it appear in a city or um, just like in any sort of a rural landscape, how this could um, appear. I won't see that really in the heart of a city because um, I mean, um, in my head, it wouldn't obviously work, but somewhere and just urbanize it maybe through that and creating new activities and new things to do. I think that would be interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments for Laure? Um, thank you so much for your presentation. It was a very kind of coherent and clear uh, presentation. It's a really beautiful project. Um, I suppose I'm really curious in the context of making and, and given your kind of really, uh, your real interest in fashion and the way you took us through this story so rigorously, I was wondering if you'd sort of uh, made any um, sort of clothes or you know whether you're going to bring in that sort of textile um, language into your project at all? Um, there was an idea of just bringing some of the textures from the outfits into the urban elements and sort of really creating um, this very um, well different of space and even maybe not even something that wouldn't even be technically possible. Um, just like in Caramelo, where it's um, com complete fantasy. So maybe creating a very fantastic space um, and just taking this really um, unreal approach, maybe. That could be a way, I think. Yeah, I guess in the context of making, we, we're talking about uh, digital making. No? You made a catalog, you kind of uh, represented the space. Um, so perhaps uh, we could talk about this, the idea of digital making, no? what, what uh, we've seen a lot of physical making. Uh, so perhaps you have any comments, Pablo or Arthur, about this kind of difference, what digital making gives you over physical making in relation to Lore's uh, project? Okay, I'll, I'll try to jump in on that. <laughs> um, well, uh, yeah, uh, first, I think uh, I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, the project is, is really interesting. Um, I also think that it's uh, very different to what we just saw before. So, uh, so it's good for us to, you know, to, to check us a little bit, you know, and uh, put us out of our kind of uh, comfort zone. So, so I appreciate that as well. Um, I think, I don't know, I will be worried to say, well, you know, this is, 
uh, the word making is, is a bit, you know, it's strong, it's, it's, it's charged, I think. Uh, you say digital, digital making, um, I suppose you could, you know, I, I suppose it could be some sort of digital making. Um, there's one thing that I, that I always try to kind of push for that's really related to craft, you know, and, and um, when, you, when you make observations about something, you know, so everything that we've been seeing today is, is in, being in one way or another about uh, observation. It's about how you, how you try to capture uh, what, is, what is around you, whether it's a space, uh, an object, uh, a material, you know, um, a type of music, you know, um, a video clip. And I think that observation, as, as, as you start kind of uh, dissecting it, um, you, you start to understand what different pieces, you know, uh, can you use again to put them together in a different, in a, in a specific way, you know, through basically starting the craft to actually um, uh, about how you put things back together. And, um, and so, so yes, I, this is kind of a digital, digital cuisine, I would say in a way, you know, uh, but, you know, I, I suppose it's also, it's also about making, I think, um, I think my, my question would be more about how do you, how do you, how do you take this this new vocabulary you 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 encounter? Um, and I know you already put it in, into into a place, but I wonder how how would you like to um, communicate the physicality of this? You know, when when you when you show let's say a type of light or a color or a texture, you know, or different optics, um, how how would you like to push for these things to actually have uh, a some level of physicality. Um. Um, well, obviously, this idea of textures, I think, um, takes this idea of physicality, but um, maybe in the way that um, people experience it in some way, because being physical is something that just does something to you. Um, and it goes beyond just having different materials and, and things like that, um, in my opinion, just um, trying to make the space more tangible in some way um, because my drawings are very flat in some way um, and maybe making adding more three-dimensionality or sort of um, trying to find a way to translate more feelings or just um, to feel something a bit more if that makes sense um, because architecture is about feeling things mm. and not just only looking at them yeah mm. I don't know if that answers that <laughs> Question. Yeah, yeah, it's just uh, you know uh, I'm curious because uh, I mean the, the 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 type of let's say the what you were observing uh, I don't think it was necessarily kind of super rich in you know the this kind of traditional way of understanding like it's not a rock it's not you know but it's a lot about surfaces and textures and bright colors and you know things that uh, are are very expressive. You know, um, but just in a slightly different way. So you know, it's true they they may be more related to you know fashion design or other other areas. You know, it, there's nothing wrong in in you know in using paint or patterns. You know, or stuff like that. But uh, that's why I wanted to kind of ask you this because the the sure the the, the term of scale kind of varies. You know, and all of a sudden it's very difficult when things are flat. You know, you can really relate much to them, you know, you, you don't, you're not sure whether you are too small or too, too big in comparison to an object, but it may be something quite fascinating to explore, you know, uh, this bidimensionality of the three-dimensionality, you know, um, it may be more related to, to what you were kind of um, uh, looking at it, uh, through, through these uh, Perreo videos, I think, I don't know. Perhaps, perhaps also there's uh, the, this idea of rulemaking. You talk about regulations, laws, and how these laws allow you or not allow you to use the space. Sometimes there are signs or lines on the ground, and now you're looking into sports, uh, sports uh, fields, and they have rules and they have uh, uh, kind of lines on the floor, and you follow those lines. So I think perhaps there is a nice opportunity there, no? Which is perhaps uh, uh, making the most of of, of rules or breaking the rules somehow with with your proposal now 
uh, can I jump in? Yeah, yes, please. All uh, right, okay. Um, it's it's very interesting to, and apologies, I, I had to actually Google these artists because that's when I know I'm old, you know, right? When I can't really know who Rosalia or... Um, but you, you talked about feelings and, 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 and three-dimensionality. I think, to be honest, um, a movie, a music video, a, is mostly about time and four-dimensionality. Uh, so beyond uh, the space, I think what I'm really missing is the sequencing of action and how things come from the artist to the outside, from inside to outside. You actually said it. Like feelings are, you know, when I was a DA, we kept on talking about top down, bottom up, and stuff. But actually, what what seems to be the the case here and more generally nowadays is that it's from within. It's like it's it's kind of from from your um, from your personality, from your background, from from what these person are trying to express. I mean, from the little amount that I've just googled <laughs> and 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 seen that they're very colorful artists, like in in every ways and in every kind of energy and and the music itself is like it's got this rhythm. Rhythm is an architecture, um, and I would love for you to abstract things a bit more than just taking print screens of sequences and actually try to find a way to express the stuff that you've abstracted with your own method and that method of abstraction leads you to a language rather than do thumbnails and then a 3D. I just feel like the process of making is iterative. And in that sense, that maybe replies to Nacho's question, which was digital making versus physical. The problem with the, the digital world is we're not very iterative. Whereas when you do physical model, you have no choice but to be iterative. And so I think it's a little bit like, this is what I've observed, this is the space I've made. But uh, you know, I would prefer a, a smoother, a smoother, softer transition, so that it's not one or the other. Yeah, I I think that something that might help to almost unlock this slightly is to think about as well the way you're presenting your work to us. So, um, you know, all these ideas you're talking about, um, I think as Arthur's alluding to, you're presenting them in quite sort of a traditional uh, way, almost in a PowerPoint kind of presentation. Whereas if you really look to challenge that and do it through an animation or, you know, something we've not really considered, uh, that might help also to unlock some of the, th the techniques that you're using spatially. Um, and I also thought that your sort of last slides where you showed this space transforming between day and night, something that really stuck out was the importance of lighting and that interactive element. And maybe that's something to explore a bit further as well, because that kind of crosses the realm of digital and physical. Um, so sort of if you looked more into lighting interaction. Um, sorry, I just, I, I'd like to add something else because, um, yeah, the, I'm just still thinking about this physicality of things, you know? So um, I, I really like the bidimensionality of, you know, the, 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 the imaginary you, you came up with, you know? So maybe, maybe it's more about augmented reality. Maybe it's, a, it's about mixing, you know, uh, reality. It's about bringing stuff that is bidimensional, you know, applied to something that, you know, has a, a different kind of three-dimensionality that you can touch, but then you're bringing something that you can see and may hear, but not necessarily touch. And, and you can play with this, this dichotomy in a way, you know, so, so uh, you can either confuse things or generate tension between, you know, different, different spaces, add more quality, I don't know, change them completely, make something three-dimensional to turn flat. I don't know. Um, I think there is a way of communicating these two worlds, you know, using the kind of the, the, the properties of what you observe already, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think, Laura, you're in a great position now to, to take this project to the, to the next stage, which is more uh, designed. You have discovered things that perhaps we're taking for granted that, uh, and, and they're not that easy to discover, how the spaces are activated differently during the day and during the night, and how the position of the, of the lights might completely change the way the space is used. So I think there are super interesting subjects now for you to explore in, in the second stage of the project. And uh, I think it's very exciting. And, and I really look forward to seeing what you come up with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lo, for your presentation. Fantastic work. Thanks Thank a lot. Alan, thank you. Thank you, Arthur, Madi, and Pablo for your comments. And I think we have now the last group. And Hao Zhang, Zhengjie, and Jihan, are you with us? 
Yes. Hello. 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 How are you? Good. Thank you. So who's presenting? So who's presenting? I'm presenting. Yeah, I'll share this. I'll share this. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. What? Okay, um, as Susan sometimes mentions, illness is a nice set of life. It should be considered as a regular part of everyday lives. But the reality is quite the opposite. People are more willing to treat illness as metaphors which expel the patient from the society. And the contemporary design of hospital infection enhances this kind of alienation by applying the idea of panopticon. Though the healthcare system nowadays is centralized, but the treatment process of every single patient is in fact decentralized and require high level of collaboration. Thus, in order to provide a more humanitarian and efficient medical system to the people, we need to extract the decentralized treatment process from the centralized hospital and directly distribute the healthcare to everybody. Then we try to construct the control system of medical resources management. Inspired by a real-time communication navigation app called Waze, we try to simulate how the system's agents will achieve real-time communication on the different rule sets. By considering the complexity in real urban context, the system will get access to several infrastructures and types of information in the city in access simulation. Multiple layers of units with different functions are introduced to fulfill the various requirements made by different people. Our system will not replace the existing hospital, but to act as an augment to achieve the decentralization of medical resources with mobile units. Complexity of urban context and medical resources then became the driven concept of generation process of the units. The final version of unit is it's, uh, it's designed to be more flexible with different layers and sizes to either cope with different medical resources or become global carrier. Different types of mobilities, including walking, flying, and rolling are embedded in the units to provide the capability of adaptive distribution. For the combination, we use electromagnets to connect them to each other. The size of this unit is not only related to the size of the medical resources, but also relevant to the proportion. Thus, a high density of packing can be achieved in both 2D and 3D, and they can switch between the two states. There are four types of units. Flying units break the limitation of local flexible mobility, which are able to carry lightweight medicine and all devices. By replacing the small inside vessels, it can be functioned as containers or the vaccine injectors. For the booking unit, by using inflation and deflation strategy, the transformation of soft, rope, soft body is able to provide first aid or the immobilization. And the rolling unit with fast speed can provide oxygen concentrator, which can make contribution to the situation of ventilator shortage. All these units or the people can be carried by the carrier unit, which using the monoware strategy. To prevent the population from either too small or too high, multiple simulations with a different number of units in place are constructed to decide the formula of calculating quantity. By running simulations for a certain period of time, the results have shown the different abilities to treat the patient. Based on the results, we can deduce a population formula which based on the measure of area and disease rates. As cities are usually crowded, the system requires the capability to communicate with urban context. All units will get access to road traffic information and analyze them with navigation strategy, which applies real-time communication. When the initial route is considered to cost too much time, they will automatically reroute to select the fastest path. Medical situation in real world is constantly changing, so the distribution of units also need to be adaptive. To tackle the complexity, a machine learning strategy is used to analyze the disease rate in different areas. The result will become a reference of distribution management process. The destination design process is based on the data of the diseases in the city and the communication between carrier units and equipment units inside them. As the process is communication based, the destination will change dynamically and enable the finite medical resources to be redistributed through robotic frameworks. The carrier units also function as a platform for other units to charge and resupply. As charging and resupply processes of carrier units are communication based, the most suitable charging points and hospitals will be selected in real time to keep the system in operation. Units, with, units will automatically communicate with each other and surrounding environment through a built-in local network and sensor system. With all information acquired, they are able to avoid any obstacles on the city roads and auto-drive to the locations of patients who are assigned to them.
We believe that by using real-time distribution system and robotic frameworks to decentralize medical resources can help to augment the existing healthcare system and give more comfortable treatment to the people at home. Also for the emergency scenario like car accidents, by evaluating task hierarchy of each unit, the network will immediately active proper units to work with the existing medical care system. Last but not least, we thought the best way for everyone to get the coronavirus test or vaccination is at home. The system will organize the data of people who are above the age of 80 or with underlying health conditions, and units are deployed to provide a mosquito-like injection. At last, care unit will collect all your stuff and providing disinfection. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for your presentation. Anyone would like to start? Madi, Pablo, Arthur? Uh, I mean, I, I got a, a, a big question, I guess. If, is it flying? And if it's rolling, why is it not flying altogether? I, sorry, it's a very naive question, no? but I'm, I'm curious. Uh, 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 well, it's, it's because we want to provide different mobilities. Um, like we, we can make all robots flying, but you, you know, a flying need to have a lightweight structure. So it can't carry, let's say, um, stuff like a CPR robot, which can carry by a working robot, or uh, some heavy stuff, a ventilator, or some, I mean, next generation diagnosed devices, which carry by the bus rolling unit. So, that's the reason, you know, we only use flying units for some um, certain options. Thank you. I, I, I mean, I really like the thoroughness of actually uh, 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 kind of studying, uh, uh, kind of uh, and trying to make it real, uh, kind of understanding the technologies that could provide these uh, and, and the design efforts to, to actually make it happen. No, but I, I, what I see, it's a provocation and an interesting one. Um, it's kind of great to, to think that everyone can have a, a um, healthcare and everything one, and the healthcare can be deployed very, very quickly and efficiently and healthcare for, for all. But it, at the same time, it's, it's, it's scary, no? Because that means that to make this happen, perhaps there's a huge database of, of things and uh, it needs to be centralized. So the, 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 the control mechanism of this system and who below who owns this this uh, control is it's a in, interesting uh, thing uh, to consider no so I think this is a great a great proposal a great project but raises some interesting and scary questions no um, so what what are your thoughts about about uh, about this kind of is this a provocation. Yeah, well, I think um, if you go to NHS nowadays they have let's say all the information of citizens like and their previous medical history and if uh, our system will provide you some public health um pop, uh, it's not public public health institution like nhs i, I think it's um it's not that much problem problematic and um also we think uh, technologies like fatal rec uh, recognition yeah, they can be used um, to, let's say, uh, steal your privacy, some kind of that. But I mean, uh, people can't do it anyway with that technology. So we think um, the best, uh, uh, we think it's best to provide this technology a good use, like um, putting it uh, with your um, healthcare, with the healthcare system. Yeah, we thought the opportunity of the project is the hacking into the existing platform. In many of our studies that we saw by using existing technology, we want to using the existing infrastructure and the platform that we are not put there necessary for care. So we want to redict, redirect them and reproduce them interacted with our design of the units and the systems. Yes, trying to um, working, co co uh, collaborate with, um, work with the existing hospital system to augment the existing hospital system. Um, it's, it's a super interesting project because on the one hand, it's kind of feels like terrifyingly uh, kind of 
like in the in an unreal future but on the other hand it feels very real because we're all living with this virus um which I think brings it very close to home I think the the main kind of thing that hit me was that you're solving you're looking to solve like a very physical problem but I think a lot of health issues are also sort of mental and have a social aspect to them um and I I don't know it feels quite terrifying to me that um you might just interface with technology like a lot of times when especially elderly people go to the GP or to hospital actually like they're quite lonely and just want a conversation um and I suppose I was wondering uh, whether these things are they, are they something that are operating with the hospital and GP system or you know do hospitals suddenly become just docking stations for this machinery um, and how do you kind of ensure that people are also getting social care and and looking after their mental health well we have a research about um, how many kinds of let's say treatment can be delivered to home nowadays uh, the result is 46 percent but you know there are uh, always some um, let's say large operations like surgery you, you need to do it at hospital but uh, what we want to do is we can distribute some kind of treatment I mean it's not that um, not that uh, let's say um, it's, it's it don't need very huge machines like you just simply need to take a blood test but uh, let's say in current medical system, you need to go to NHS and maybe wait for two weeks or three weeks. Um, so our thought is to decentralize. Uh, we, we have a, our thought is to bring a decentralization system to distribute this kind of treatment to home, but not to totally replace a hospital. I mean, are you? I suppose it's the human interaction as well that I'm interested in, like, like that you seem to be looking to replace. Uh, sorry? I, I suppose it's the human interaction that I'm kind of quite intrigued by, like how, what level of human interaction do you decide can be replaced by robots? Like well, here, uh, yeah, you, you go first. <laughs> well, um, actually, um, today's technology is, uh, I mean, we have looked into some researches about remote surgery like they can do very precise, as a robot, they can do very precise surgery actions, uh, and maybe it's better than human. So yeah, I, we think um, maybe for now, we don't want to go too crazy. So maybe blood tests, uh, medicine delivery, you know, when we talk about hospital, we really think about surgery, or we um, live in hospital for two weeks. But in fact, we only get blood tests and receive medicine. Um, let's say injections on insulin from them. So you know, we think at this stage, we will deliver this kind of um, treatment to people at first. And then maybe we can think of um, some other like um, uh, some other interactions um, by using um, the inflation strategy in the working unit. But that's the next step. We didn't think it through right now. Can I jump in here? Um, I, I think, yeah, it's it's uh, quite fascinating. Um, it was uh, I had to say that the presentation started very kind of fast, and uh, it's a bit difficult for me to capture all the information that you were giving us uh, in the beginning. Um, now I think I, I I managed to grasp a bit more about what the project is all about. It's just that the project is huge. This project is trying to do everything. Um, you know. Um, in, in, in many ways, you know, so, but I really value that you are starting so many levels and so many different scales, you know, from the micro scale to the micro scale and so on. Um, I'm just wondering where, where do you see the, the main, the main question you want to answer with, with, with this project, you know, what's the question you're asking yourself when, when you're, yeah. when you're, when you're, when you're trying to do this, because, um, before you jump in, because, I see, I see a lot of things, you know, so I, uh, as, as Madeline mentioned, there is something very real now. We are all stuck at home because, you know, there is a, you know, pandemic outside that, you know, is super real, you know, but, but you're, you're picturing a world of, you know, uh, pure technology, you know, uh, pure technological kind of a, uh, healthcare. 
um, where the level of trust that is needed uh, it take us you know, very far away from where we are now at, the, at this very moment. And you, I think maybe in this panel, you have already people that is quite connected to technology in one way or another. And I know a lot of things that, you know, we do have, you know, around the hospitals at this very moment, you know, and, and, and we do interact with a lot of things and we trust in things that we don't see, you know, we can order. Pablo, we lost you. You were cut. Talking about technology as well. <laughs> it's not only technology, but the bureaucracy, you know, that happens in between you and the results and whoever analyzed them and your email, you know, and we trust these things blindly. Okay. Uh, so, so yes, I'm with you that we can trust, but there is something in, in human interaction that is key when we, when we try to trust our body to somebody. You know, uh, because that's what yeah. we're doing, right? We're trusting our bodies to somebody else. You know, it's probably the most precious thing. And and it's not even that. You know, when you have family, imagine how would you trust somebody else's body to some? It's it's a level of trust that is huge that is needed. You know, for, for in order for it to happen. You know, so so I wonder. You know, if if this also, if if what you whatever you you the the question you're trying to ask yourself also involves in understanding how we interact with objects, how we interact with things, how we interact with technology, not, not in the technocratic way, okay? Not, and not in the purely functional way. I, I, I trust that your you know, objects will fly and, 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 and run around and cluster together and all the system will work, you know, and they will pump and, and resuscitate you. You know, I'm, I'm more, my question is more about why do they have to only or the, the, the respond to to the, the function they're doing you know uh, isn't the human interaction probably the biggest part of the job that they are actually doing and how do they respond to that you know so that's why I'm I'm, I'm questioning you about the question you're asking yourself yeah that's an interesting question about the uh, human interfacing is very important sometimes you know um, the conversation between the robot and human may be much more trusted than the between the human and human. And uh, in the procedure of our the treatment, we want our starting point, like the first question, like you said, uh, just to mention, uh, our starting point is like to bring the hospital to you, aims to provide the patients, much more patients with the possibility to uh, get the care at home because they will be um, accompanied with their loved, right? And like, like for now, um, people, like some elderly people, they just had to um, stay at uh, in the hospital, you know, cold hospital without nobody can help her, just the, the machine or the doctors. But what we want to is like uh, the people who get disease, who are not in a good condition, are capable at home and get treated. That's the physical things, right? It's a, like the re, uh, relief of them. Um, and also like um, the trust between the human and human um, in our, like in our system is we, we thought that, um, how to say, sorry. Um, Um, I mean, for the technology stuff, um, uh, all the technology we are using, they are all in this right now. Uh, what we, uh, what we gonna do is just put them together. And you said, yeah, that's right. Some um, yeah, people are willing to trust more about um, like another human body instead of a robot you've never seen before. But um, if we look uh, deep into our everyday lives, uh, I I doubt how uh, to what extent it's. I mean, um, I would rather trust my mobile phone instead of trust a stranger, right? <laughs> so, yeah, you know, and also we think uh, illness is expel, expelled from our society for too much time and we don't um, consider illness as part of it. So um, uh, we, what we want to propose is to bring back uh, the illness from um, the expel. Like by using this machine, um, let's say uh, when this uh, project is 
um, taking uh, taking place in 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 the real world, let's say. And I mean, people are gonna uh, trust trust these machines day by day instead of just um, I don't know how to say instead of just uh, reject these machines because it's it's really useful and convenient. And also, uh, for example, in some sen uh, scenario like today, the epidemic health uh, crisis, some people, they reluctantly to go to a hospital to get just a simple test or just a very simple treatment because don't, people don't want to get affected from coronavirus, right? That's the problem of a centralized uh, hospital system for nowadays. And uh, our uh, decentralized uh, system is not to replace the existing hospital. It's like uh, the augment of the existing hospital, like uh, working with the ambulance, working with the GPs um, to give the, uh, all those, uh, because it's very complicated during the whole medical system. There's a lot of procedures like uh, between people and people or between people and machine, but we want to sum up like the blood test. It's very simple, right? For the they uh their tibis a patient, um, they are, when they are, need a very emergent like urgency medicines or get some like devices, and the the robot can be delivered to them and they target to them. It's very customized to mm -hmm. the patients what they need. So that's why that's mm -hmm. what we want to do. <laughs> Thank you, Arthur. Do you do you yeah, have a comment? Yeah, I'd I'd love to jump in. Sorry, sorry, because it, it was a really really intense like body of work, and and I think it's I, I, I'm a bit like Pablo. I needed to sort of breathe and understand what's going on, and I think what's really good about this open jury to some extent is that the question has shifted from what you guys might have thought was the key things, mobility, all these things, to actually the human versus robot interaction in healthcare. And these are very different discussions that actually is not really present in what is an extremely dense presentation. And so in a way it's good because it also helps you as a group to breathe and think, are we focusing on the right thing? Is this mobility thing really the, the key element to that? Is it really decentralization that matters here? Because you're talking about either fully centralized or fully decentralized without realizing there's many, many different layers in between. Like in different countries have reacted different, differently. In France, for example, all of the vaccines and all of the uh, uh, test units have been decentralized in all of the local pharmacies. And so that is absolutely brilliant compared to say here where you need to go to these dense test centers that are just really, really rare and so on. And so you have local places where you can decentralize in ways that are a little bit less is disruptive than having kind of robots running around. And I say this, but um, this question of mobility, is this really the, uh, that's why I cringed at the beginning. I was like, is this really the issue? Because in times of pandemic, it's not like it's hard to get your Amazon delivered, right? It's not like it's hard to get your Ubers delivered. There's absolutely zero traffic or, uh, you know, so uh, the intelligence, and there's so much intelligence in your project. I don't know if you're placing it in the right spot to some extent. I'd rather hear about the complications about having a flying robot trying to punch a needle in a vein, you know, because to me, that's like really complex. And I agree with you. I trust robots to have surgery on me. I had it for my eyes and I, and you know, there was a human next to me holding my hand, but uh, I, you know, I, I just, when I saw that needle flying in the air, trying to aim, uh, I'm like, can you imagine the problem of drones, the problems of like uh, pr precision, the problem of fear? Is there another robot that is here to reconfort me? Is there, you could like bring this further. You can actually have a, a, a comforting robot or someone else that acts as the nurse, not necessarily just the surgeon. Um, and so, and also there's something that, that came to my brain. I don't know if you know about the Theranos story, which is this, uh, she was like the, the, the youngest billionaire um, um, ever, I think, uh, self-made. And her theory was to decentralize um, medicine by having a patch. Uh, that would check your blood at any given time. And when you need something, it would throw it in, right? And it was like a little patch, you had the patent for it. And <laughs> it ended up really not working because of the technical challenges of, of stuff. I, I'm just curious how much you can also kind of zoom out from the technology. And I say, I love technology, obviously, but if you can zoom out from it and look at the actual issues and actually s spend a little bit more time in your presentation about what is actually the issue that we're trying to tackle before selling the, 
the product because you guys are a great salesperson. <laughs> like you're really going for it. But I would love to understand if you've located issues correctly and then apply the intelligence to the right spot. I think that's my main comment on there. Yeah, I think I think what is very good and I, I would say it's excellent is that uh, a project generates debate and when when someone creates something or makes a project and it touches you and you kind of are you provoking me? I think that is that's very good. So you did that very well. Obviously, uh, there, there are multiple issues to I don't know to talk about, but I think that's that's what it's important in your project and the way I see it that it generates. A debate and it makes you reconsider our relationship with robots in the context of healthcare. We think about pandemics, we think about emergencies, ethics, like do we do I prefer not to be to have a medical uh, uh, healthcare or do I prefer to have one from a robot? No, these kind of issues are, are great and you are provoking them. So excellent for that. Yeah.